Her research interests include clinical outcomes and the risk of IBD therapy, pharmacoepidemiology, pharmacoeconomics, uh, as well as the impact of race and ethnicity in IBD. She's also very interested in the pediatric to adult transition. Um, and in collaboration with Seattle Children's Hospital, she had developed the first pediatric to adult IBD transition clinic in the Northwest. I'm sure she's working on that here in Ohio State. Uh, she serves on multiple committees, including the Crohn's and Colitis National Professional Education Committee and the Clinical Research Alliance in IBD. Uh, she's also uh, invited clinical faculty at AIBD, Advances in uh, Inflammatory Bowel Disease, and she's a fellow of the American College of Gastroenterology. Uh, I think you guys are very lucky to have her. We miss her, and she's going to tell us about biosimilars, which is a hot topic these days. Dr. Afzali. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the introduction, and we're going to now speak about biosimilars. And it was nice to see those ARS results because I think a year ago, if we had these same questions, a lot of us would perhaps have gotten some of those questions wrong already. So um, I think over the past year, we're learning more about biosimilars, and now we'll talk about the role of use of biosimilars in inflammatory bowel disease. Here are my disclosures. So the key points I want us to take home after the 25-minute talk this morning is to understand that biosimilars are not generics or identical, but rather similar to the originator. This is relevant because immunogenicity matters. And there's consequences of this because the immune system may perhaps tolerate the innovator or the originator, but then with the exposure to a biosimilar, perhaps now there's a risk of sensitization or an allergic response that is triggered in the body because now there's a novel or new product. In Interchangeability is a good test of sensitization, and we'll talk about this. And we need to remain cautious with the use of, of our biosimilars potentially if, there's, if we're using it in non-medical switching or substitution. Now, biosimilar, biosimilarity, it's, uh, uh, these are agents that are highly similar with minor differences without any clinically meaningful differences regarding safety, purity, potency compared to the reference product or the originator. Now, unlike small molecules where you can have an identical exact copy, hence the generic, we don't have that with our biologics. So biologics, whether we call it the originator, whether we call it the reference drug or the innovator, your biosimilars are just that, similar, not identical copies. So why is that? Well, if you look at this, when we look at our small molecule agents, such as aspirin, they have a low molecular weight. These are not complex molecules, so it's easy to replicate it and making an identical copy. Now, conversely, with our bigger, uh, higher molecular weights, such as our monoclonal antibodies, you can see that the structure is very complex. And so because of this complexity, it is impossible to make an identical copy of it, hence the word biosimilar, because now we could only get as similar to the originator as possible. And the complexity comes with the protein structures, because even though the primary and secondary structures are identical, what happens is at the tertiary and quaternary structured level, this is where the changes happens. Glycosylation, addition of sugar molecules, for example, differences in the manufacturing processes, for example. These are where the changes happen, and this is why it is impossible to make an identical copy, but rather have a similar product. And this brings us to the snowflake effect, recognizing that no two snowflakes are alike. And in fact, we see this not only when we are comparing a biosimilar to the originator, but then also there's batch to batch differences among even the same originator. So for example, batch to batch differences in infliximab A versus infliximab B. So unlike the originators, which goes through a rigorous process of clinical trials in order to evaluate for safety and efficacy, what we have when we produce our biosimilars is that the majority of emphasis, time, and money is being spent on the analyticals in a sense of how 
well does my biosimilar work in regards to being comparable regarding safety, efficacy, and all the rest compared to the originator without having any clinically meaningful differences. So the efforts here are different, and therefore it's an abbreviated process because of this effort, because right now we're not trying to see if this medicine works, but more so is my biosimilar similar to the originator product. Other requirements for our biosimilars and the use of it is that it has to have the same mechanism of action compared to your originator or innovator product. No new indications can be granted for the biosimilar that the originator was not granted for. It has to have the same route of administration and dosage, and still it must comply with good manufacturing practices. Also, biosimilars can seek licensure for fewer indications than the originator based off of the different patents, and the FDA must be able to still accept some differences, whether it's formulation or delivery packages. But again, no clinically meaningful differences can be seen. In other words, you cannot have a bio better or a bio superior. If you do have a product that works better than the originator or the innovator, now what happens is that the, this product will have to go through that same initial rigorous process as the innovator because in essence, it's a new drug. We've talked about extrapolation in the past, and for us to understand the extrapolation, it's basically supporting biosimilarity in one condition of use to support licensure in other conditions or diseases. Now, most of the studies at present has been primarily picked rheumatoid arthritis as the initial condition or indication of use to compare to in regards to safety and efficacy and similarity to the originator, and after that has extrapolated to other indications and diseases and specifically inflammatory bowel disease. There remains questions whether that initial extrapolation should have been the right one. Should we have perhaps used ulcerative colitis as a better condition or disease to evaluate for safety and efficacy? But regardless, I would say that we should feel comfortable with recognizing that, we, yes, we have extrapolated the use and the indication based off of rheumatoid arthritis as well as enclosing spondylitis data, and we have now long-term data demonstrating comparable safety, efficacy, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, as well as potential immunogenicity or development of antibodies is what that is defined as. In regards to interchangeability, and really this is the crux of the issue here, but interchangeability, basically you're substituting for the originator product without the intervention of the prescriber. Okay, so that's what interchangeability means. Now to date, the FDA has not granted interchangeability. And in fact, they are proposing potential ways of where and why the FDA may eventually grant interchangeability, but to date, ARS question, the uh, FDA has not granted this, right? Um, so they're proposing, their draft guidelines proposes that this needs to be a case-by-case -case basis. We need to determine the interchangeability across all indications of use, at least three switches, and this is relevant because to date, the studies that we have, it's a single switch, okay? So the FDA is proposing at least a three-switch uh, uh, study to be able to really evaluate interchangeability, and of course we need a sufficiently long window in order to appropriately evaluate this switch time period to ensure and evaluate for all the concerns we may have and specifically risk of immunogenicity and or loss of response. Now, state substitution laws in regards to which state allows you or not allows you to uh, switch your patients from one the originator to the biosimilar, it remains a little bit by each state. In other words, per state jurisdiction, it determines whether or not you will or will not be notified or asked uh, to switch. And sometimes it would be an automatic substitution but through a pharmacist, for example, who would take your originator or innovator and switch to a biosimilar. Again, this is state by state jurisdiction and interchangeability of biosimilars not yet approved for, uh, for IBD. So this remains an evolving topic.
But regardless of it still remaining an evolving topic, we have to understand that our payers and our insurers are still potentially, I don't know if some of you have already received some letters, but there is some ask either of us or to our patients directly where the insurers or payers are reaching out and asking them to consider a switch to a biosimilar. Now, what I want us to be very careful with is that even though interchangeability has not been approved yet, and this is a state-by-state -state jurisdiction in regards to which states will even do this eventually in the future, but at present we have to understand that our current studies have evaluated the innovator to one switch of a biosimilar, of one biosimilar. What is of, of concern is that in the future, what's going to happen potentially in the risk is that you may be asked this year to switch to one biosimilar, but what happens next year? Will the payers and the pharma uh, company now ask you to switch to another biosimilar? Those type of studies between these different biosimilars have not been evaluated as extensively as originator to one biosimilar. So we have to be careful with this. If, if we were to take this extrapolation and, and extrapolate from the European experience, so after a year of having biosimilars available, our European colleagues feel very comfortable with its use, okay? And so definitely the comfort level after a year of having biosimilars available, they're comfortable with it. When we talk about that angst as well, and so you can see that they're more confident and there's less angst with the use of biosimilars in the European experience, and this was a survey assessment. What about in the United States? Well, we have Inflectra, we have Renflexis, and we have Amgevita, specifically for adalimumab or Humira the, being the originator for the Amgevita, which is still uh, dealing with legal issues and has not been approved yet due to patent issues there. But we currently have your Inflectra and Renflexis as your biosimilars. And we can, again, go from the current data that we have when this was a large meta-analysis of 19 different studies, indications being both rheumatoid arthritis as well as inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see from this meta-analysis that it was comparable. Safety, efficacy, and results were comparable when you had the biosimilar use as compared to the originator. And in, these were the one switch, so from the originator to the biosimilar. They went as far as saying preliminary evidence supports biosimilarity and interchangeability, uh, we need to be careful with that word, of biosimilar and the reference TNF inhibitors. When we look specifically, these were 11 different studies in a, in a meta-analysis specifically for inflammatory bowel disease. Again, from this meta-analysis, you can see that there were comparable results of the use of either your originator in comparison to your biosimilar CTP13. PROSED was a multi-center prospective study to evaluate about 550 patients that you can see, and there was, they were either TNF-naive or TNF-exposed, and from this, about 100 patients were switched after 18 mean of 18 infusions um, and, and mean follow-up of about four to six months, and based off of this, other than the infusion reactions that were found to be more frequent in patients who were pre-exposed to infliximab, Safety otherwise was not of an immediate concern based off of the PROSIT. And then when we talk about efficacy based off of this multicenter prospective study, you can see in regards to risk for loss of response or treatment persistency, meaning can they remain on this therapy for at least a year after initiation or the switch. And from this, you can see that it was comparable among all three uh, cohorts, uh, whether they were naive to it, previously exposed to uh, originator, or if they were switched from originator, one switch to the biosimilar. So then, again, it brings us back to the crux of the issue in regards to what about this non-medical switching. We're saying that extrapolation, it's working, it's fine, it's comparable, but why are we concerned about this switch? And really, the issue comes with the risk of immunogenicity. So the clinical consequences when we talk about interchangeability, as I defined earlier, the switching or substitution, perhaps even without our knowledge of this happening for our patients, there's consequences in this. And at present, we currently lack evidence to support the critical concepts of what and when we should allow for switch or substitution. The substitution current policies are highly variable, okay? So then it's difficult to monitor. How long do you monitor it? Can we determine the risk or the potential risk of what may 
happen when we're studying these different diseases. Are all diseases the same? And it's not, right? So that risk of loss of response, immunogenicity with these switches and, and a risk for sensitization, triggering an allergic response is all factors that we need to take into account. And, and so, again, what we're primarily uh, concerned about with these non-medical switch patients, switching them when they're doing stable, doing fine, to a biosimilar, we worry about this risk of sensitization, the risk of triggering the immune response, and now you have that risk of development of antibodies or immunogenicity, and as well as loss of response to your therapy because perhaps of this switch. So how do we best evaluate this? Well, the best way is to have better, well-designed, multi-switch studies so that one switch perhaps is not good enough. But we need to, to provide multiple switches and for a good duration of time to really determine if they're really truly is a trigger in the immune system triggering that sensitization and loss of response or immunogenicity. And the, this is a scenario that we need to look at in the sense that, that we're, if we're switching, we shouldn't just switch from originator to one biosimilar, but let's start looking at what's happening when we're switching them to multiple biosimilars and then during what duration and what's happening then in regards to are we potentially putting our patients at risk of altering the pharmacokinetics? Are we placing our, our patients at risk for inducing anaphylaxis? Is there a, a loss of response now because of development of neutralizing antibodies? These are factors that we really need to take into serious account because this is these type of switch scenarios is what's going to potentially happen, the reality of what's going to happen with our payers and insurers eventually. We have two current studies that really has uh, been able to answer some of our switch uh, results in, in regards to this indication and, and, uh, and uh, the results of that. Both of these studies, which I'll talk about, these were non-inferiority studies with a margin of 15 or 20 percent, respectively, and we'll talk about what that means. So the North Switch study, you guys have all probably heard of the North Switch study, which was a double-blind non-inferiority study of a margin of 15 percent, meaning that basically there should be no more than a 15 percent difference from the originator to a switch to the biosimilar. Now, the North Switch study, the primary endpoint was to evaluate occurrence of disease worsening at 52 weeks. And this was defined, of course, disease worsening is defined differently when you have an aggregation of five different disease states. And these were the five different disease states that you can see where about half of the disease conditions for our patients here was inflammatory bowel disease. So when you look at the North Switch results from what you can see here is that overall there was a difference from infliximab in this situation to the biosimilar CTP13 of 4.4%, which tells us that overall the study met its objective in a sense of the non-inferiority that there's no greater than 15% difference, 4.4 seems fine. So North Switch said that on a non-inferiority study, switching from the originator to the biosimilar, it's fine. But what I want to caution us with still here is that for Crohn's disease, it was 14.3%. Okay. And so this was something that we really needed to take into account, knowing that North Switch was an aggregation of the five different indications, and certainly at 14.3%, if it was better powered, better well-designed specifically for the disease of inflammatory bowel disease, would we see perhaps a difference? And, and, and I don't know that. We need to evaluate that further. The other study that uh, is a multi-center trial to evaluate effects of switching from CTP13 and the originator product, this was 220 patients with active Crohn's disease. And for these patients, you could see that they were all naive to TNFs previously. Okay, and this is relevant, and we'll talk about this, but the primary endpoint here was rate of uh, at least a 70-point difference in the CDI at week six, as well as secondary assessments of the different factors as described. The study design included four different arms. There was your originator that continued with the originator until the end of the study. You had the uh, excuse me, your biosimilar that continued to the biosimilar, and then you had the switch where they went from originator to biosimilar or biosimilar to the originator. So four different arms. This was a non-inferiority of 20%, okay? So again, asking that we should not see greater than a 20% difference from 
the, the different arms. And so from here, you can see at week six, primary endpoint comparable in regards to safety and efficacy, uh, or excuse me, for clinical response, which was their primary endpoint here. The extended uh, data up to 54 weeks, where we now have now the switch data for this, up to 54 weeks, you can see among all four arms, and I know those numbers are small, comparable. Uh, diff uh, the, the, there was no big uh, uh, change in, in regards to clinical response at the end of 54 weeks. In regards to risk for immunogenicity at the end of one year, also the results were mostly comparable with the exception of slightly lower at the 12.7% for Inflectra that was switched to Remicade. And then when we talk about risk for infusion reaction or, or adverse side effects, you can see that in regards to the different four arms that are described here, it was comparable in regards to infusion-related reactions. There was a, um, a slightly higher percentage of treatment emergent serious adverse events among those who went from the originator, in this case Remicade, to your biosimilar. Now, the limitations of both of these studies that I just described to you is that we need to still remember this non-inferiority component. When we talk about 15%, 20%, what's the right percent when we try to say that, yes, we can safely and effectively uh, uh, switch from one to the other? Now, the SONIC trial that we've always uh, talked about and referred to as far as determining the use of and the indication of combination therapy it was a 12% clinically meaningful superiority when we determined that, yes, we should do a combination therapy. So is 15, 20 too high? Should we have studied at a lower percent to really determine that this is the right number? And, and that this is where more studies are indicated. But more importantly, we need to still test the immune system. When we're talking about that trigger for that allergic response, when we're talking about sensitization, we need to, it goes back to the multi-switches. We have yet to have that done. And so we're still at that unknown of what's going to happen for the risk or uh, uh, at being at risk for higher sensitization, development of antibodies. The NOR switch, again, as I told you, those point estimates, uh, it, was, it was for an aggregation of five very different disease states. But what happens when we talk about the individual states and specifically for Crohn's disease? Will that 14.3, if we appropriately powered and designed that study, will that really match up to that uh, difference of that 15% margin now? And then the other trial, I don't know if we're worried about the TNF naive patients. Okay, and so that was your other's trial that which evaluated, but I don't know if the issue is really the TNF naive because you're not at risk of triggering that immune response because they're on that originator or that biosimilar at first, never previously exposed. We're worried about those previously exposed and tolerizing their current agent, and now they're being switching back and forth potentially. Those are the patients we're concerned about. So I don't know if that really answered much of our questions. So then we talk about the economic considerations of biosimilars. Well, it costs a lot of money to develop these, right? So new biologics, about $2 billion to develop. Biosimilars, about $100 uh, to $250 million to develop. Takes about seven to 10 years for uh, these uh, to be available for clinical use. At present, about 650 different biosimilars under investigation, and still greater than 50% are in the preclinical trial phase. What we need to be very cognizant of is that biosimilars may, with this introduction, be a potential cost savings. But the important part is who will it save? Will it be cost savings for our patients, which we hope for, and that's definitely what we want? Will it improve access of biological products and use of it for our patients? That's, of course, what we want. But then, if it's insurers and payers having the cost savings and not our patients, is that what we need or want right now, right? So we have to be careful with that. There's also that psychological component. There's this perceived component, whether it's among care providers or among patients, where if they're getting um, uh, the less expensive drug, is it less efficacious? And obviously, we know that's not the case, but certainly we have to, when our patients are receiving these letters in the, in the mail, then we have to kind of be prepared to answer those type of questions as well. So then this brings us back to our payers. 
what role should our payers play in this, our insurance companies and our payers? Well, if they are really concerned in regards to changing policy, then we need their help. We need our help of our payers to potentially make some better research available, or they could take the first approach, which is watchful waiting. Let the FDA, let each state figure it out, and then the insurance companies and payers will get involved. Or perhaps they will use this as a way to be able to put pressure on really downward, uh, downward pressure to decrease the costs of our therapies. And hopefully we would love to have that kind of pressure with our payers and insurers to also be involved on our side. Perhaps we could suggest that they will allow just a one-time switch, since that's the kind of data that we have available, and promise us, guarantee us, that they won't make a switch every year, potentially, with the new uh, acceptance with a different pharma company, potentially. If they could give us that one-time switch where the prescriber is notified of that, perhaps that's fine as well. Or perhaps they will continue to and hopefully mandate more research and more evidence before they incorporate any form of policy with the use of biosimilars in the United States. So in, conclu in conclusion, biosimilars, there's no clinically meaningful differences between the originator and the biosimilar. To date, with the data that we have and the studies that we have in regards to extrapolation of data, and even the data that we have for extrapolation and, and its use in IBD-specific studies, yes, it's okay. So bringing us back to initial, is it safe, is it efficacious, is it comparable? The answer is yes. Interchangeable? We still don't know, okay? So this has not been granted by the FDA. It still remains a big concern, and so we still need to evaluate what happens in the patients with multi-switches and, and or substitutions that are happening. What's happening to these patients? Are we triggering that immune response? Are we causing changes in, in, in developing a loss of response potentially? And still be careful with your payers and insurance companies when you're thinking that, okay, I'm just going to switch. This is cheaper. My patient will be fine. They're doing fine. What your insurance company approves today does not mean what they will approve tomorrow. So when you're has, having to switch this year and then asking to now switch to another biosimilar next year, that's multi-switching among two different biosimilars, which we still don't have data and studies on. I thank you for your attention. Thank <clears throat> you.